Well, with you writing these books, I mean, there's quite a bit of, uh, I guess you say controversial type stuff in it. Do you get any flack from that from your, your old buddy? No, you want to laugh? I was very, um, I, I didn't know if I should do it. Like when I put out, before I put out my first book, I was still, I spent all this money getting a book cover designed. I got it edited and I'm standing there with my finger on the laptop. Like, do I fucking upload this thing on Amazon? Because I was terrified of getting black. But here's the thing. The two things I set out to do when I was writing these police books was I didn't want to get anybody in trouble and I didn't want to get anybody divorced. You know, I'm not a sour grapes kind of guy. Yeah. So I don't name names. I change precincts and boroughs and time periods around because I don't want to shine a spotlight on a specific person. But I am writing about the time and what was going on. I mean, yeah, a guy really did move a dead body, but I changed things around, you know what I mean? Or the guy that I know that stole a horse and carriage for a ride through Central Park, he almost got fucking killed. I changed his rank around in the time period. Listen to the vibes. Welcome everyone to another episode of Listen to the Vibes, and I have here, Mr. Vic Ferrari. He is an ex NYPD police officer who's an author. And um, we're going to talk about his books and get to know him and, and just have a great conversation. So Vic, tell us a little bit about yourself. First off, thank you for having me on your show. I greatly appreciate it. My name is Vic Ferrari. I'm born and raised in New York City. I'm a retired 20 year member of the New York City Police Department. Um, by the age of five, I knew what I wanted to do for a living. My mother used to take me to the movie theater across the street from a police station. So, you know, she was taking me to go see Herbie the Love Bug. I was running around, sticking my face in the window of police cars, wanting to see the equipment and saying, you know, one day I'm going to chase the bad guys. By age 10, my friends and I used to go to the local post office and steal FBI wanted posters and walk around the neighborhood. You know, got this wanted poster and well, some guy wanted it for a bank robbery in Arkansas. And I'm like, I'm in a local deli, like this motherfucker, this could be him. So I knew what I wanted to do at an early age. Um, by 21, I took the test. I became a member of the New York City Police Department. I worked in various units, including um, Manhattan North Narcotics, where I worked buying bust operations. But my last 10 years, I was a detective in the NYPD's auto crime division. So anything you can think of, stolen cars, chop shops, exporting stolen vehicles out of the country, mafia run businesses, homicides, you name it, we were involved in it. I was lucky enough to retire after a 20 year career. I moved down to Florida. Now I've gotten into writing. I've written six books, four of which are NYPD themed that are filled with short stories from my NYPD career. So what's the craziest thing anybody's ever reported stolen? Oh, I've had people, I've had people that were victim of a home invasion but they, it was a stash house and they were afraid they were going to get killed by the guy over them. And they, they, they called the police to report that they had gotten tied up and everything. And, and someone stole a couple of duffel bags of marijuana. <laughs> Cause they didn't want to, they wanted a police report to go back to whoever the wholesale was like, Whoa, Whoa, time out. We got robbed. I'm like, what are you fucking kidding me? Like we sent them off to the narcotics division because now you know, you better start talking, but yeah, that was early in my career. <laughs> I've heard people say that they, they called because they went to buy drugs and they end up getting something other than what they were supposed to buy. Yeah. <laughs> really? You're going to be that stupid. <laughs> happens all the time. <laughs> so what, um, tell me about your, your first book that you ever wrote. What, what was the theme of that one? I got it right here. It's called NYPD Through the Looking Glass, Stories from Inside America's Largest Police Department. It's filled, all my books are kind of the same, but different. So that, that book is filled with interesting, funny stories. So there's a story in that book about, and the NYPD, the surefire way to get in trouble as a cop or any member of the New York State Police Department is to lose your gun, shield, or ID card. If you lose any of those three things, you're going to lose 30 vacation days and they're going to put you on a year probation. So cops are paranoid in New York about losing that stuff. So there was a guy we used to work with. He wasn't too bright. He was going out one night. He lived in a shitty neighborhood and he was like, he didn't want to bring his gun with him and go out drinking. So he hid it in the one place in his apartment. He didn't think anybody would look. He hid it in his stove. Goes out, 
has a couple of cocktails, four, four hours, nine beers later, he's liquored up, comes back to the apartment, he's hungry, he goes over and preheats his oven to 425, he's gonna make some frozen pizzas, goes into, the, goes into the living room, turns on the television set, starts channel surfing. Next thing you know, the gun starts, the rounds in the gun starts exploding. He's gotta crawl out of the house on his fucking hands and knees and call the emergency service division, who's gotta recover the gun, but blew up the gun, blew up the stove, and yes, he lost 30 vacation days and was put on a year probation. Oh my God. That sounds like car 54. Where are you? Oh yeah. <laughs> all the time. There's another story from that book. Um, there was a guy when, when someone dies in New York, okay. Someone dies in their apartment, be it natural causes or unnatural causes. The cops respond, the paramedics respond Now the paramount paramedics would say, yes, he's dead. But at the end of the day, a medical examiner has to come and officially say, okay, yeah, he's dead. This is a suspicious death. Send him to the morgue. No, it's not a suspicious death and tells the family, go call the funeral home. Okay. So this can take up to hours because there's only one medical examiner in the city working at any given time. And people are either dying, you know, in the street, heart attacks, homicides, they're quite busy. So it's called sitting on a DOA. So if someone dies in a location, the police have to stay with that body until the medical examiner could come there. And that could take up to 12 hours. So it's in a housing project. This old man dies in bed and he wasn't dead all that long. And the super went to check on him. I guess they were friendly. He didn't meet him for coffee. He opens, he had the keys to his apartment, finds this elderly gentleman dead in his bed, calls 911. This lazy cop that we know who had a foot post goes up, gets in the elevator, goes up to the 15th floor, sees the dead guy there, calls an ambulance, e EMT show up. They'd say, yeah, he's dead. You got to wait for the medical examiner. So it's a Friday night. This cop wants to go out drinking. He turns around. And he doesn't want to get stuck watching this dead body. So he says, can't you take him? And they go, take him where? He's like, can't you take him to the morgue? They go, we don't do that. You know, only if he died in, in public view that we, you know, when you got to throw a sheet over somebody in the street, then we would take him to the morgue. But other than that, you got to wait for the medical examiner. So the cop's not too happy with the answer and they leave. About half hour later, that cop gets on the radio and calls a cardiac in. Well, the two EMTs that left weren't far away. They, it, he gets the same two EMTs. They come rushing up to the 15th floor with their equipment. And what do they find? The dead guy's now in the hallway. And they go, what the fuck is this? And the cop goes, oh shit, now he panics. He goes, you're not going to believe this. He goes, you guys left? The guy jumped up and went, oh, fuck. He ran through the apartment and he dropped dead again right on the fucking floor. And they go, no, he didn't. He's starting to have rigor mortis. You can tell by the way the body is positioned. He didn't get out of bed and fucking drop, drop dead in the hallway. So they start pitching a bitch. The sergeant comes. They do a pre preliminary investigation. They, they figure out that this cop is full of shit. He dragged a dead body to an apartment and dumped him in the hallway. P.S. He lost 30 vacation days, was put on a year probation. He got transferred up to the Bronx. That's where we ran into him. And uh, if that would have happened nowadays, he would have been fired or possibly arrested. But this is the good old bad days in the 90s. They gave him a pass after thumping him. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I, I bet that's not the craziest story you got. Oh, no, I've got I've got tons of crazy stories. I mean, what do you want to hear? <laughs> you want to hear death? You want to hear funny. You want to hear interesting. I can give you whatever you want, man. I mean, with a 20 year career with the New York City Police Department, like I got notes here from all my books that I could just, it's like playing a musical instrument. Like you point me in a direction where you want to hear and I'll give it to you. Well, I'd like to stay on the funny side of it. Okay. You want to do funny? Sure. Okay. I'll tell you, well, this is kind of funny. It's kind of gruesome, but it's funny. It's called the Hansel and Gretel story. Early 90s. You know, young, I'm a young guy. We're going out to cop bars and meeting girls and stuff. There's this one cop from another precinct who worked with a friend of mine. And he was an amateur magician in his spare time. So we're up at the bar having cocktails, talking to the ladies. This fucking guy rolls in. He starts pulling flowers out of his fucking wrist. He's pulling coins behind her ear. Essentially, he's cock blocking us with magic. So I turned to a friend of mine who works with him. I says, can you get this fucking guy out of here? And he goes, you know, he's the laziest cop in the world. If he took it, making balloon animals inside the police car as seriously did his NYPD career, he'd be a one man crime stopper. A couple of weeks later, these two cops, the magician and my buddy of mine, they get called into a six, four, six story basement apartment of a building. And in these basement apartments, you usually have a couple of apartments where the superintendent and his family live. So they go downstairs, 
It's just, it's a 911 calls for help and someone hangs up. So they go to door number one, they knock on the door, nobody answers. So my buddy goes to knock on door number two and the magician who's lazy goes, fuck that. We made all this noise with our radios and stuff down here. No one's down here. Come on, let's go. My, my buddy goes to knock on the door again. He goes, come on, let's get the fuck out of here. Buy a cup of coffee. And they leave. What they don't know is behind door number two, the super of the building lives there. He's, he's selling Coke out of the apartment. He gets addicted to the Coke and he's not paying his wholesalers. Well, in the drug world, they don't cancel your cable or send friendly reminders. This is your final notice. They send a couple of Albanian hitmen to kill him. But the, the hitmen are having a hard time getting him out of the apartment. So they do an old gypsy trick. What they do is they bring an attractive female. They knock on the door. They put the female's face in front of the peephole. The soup is like, holy shit. You know, I, I, got, I got a good looking customer. He opens the door. They bum rush him. They start pistol whipping him. Where's the money? Where's the coke? He doesn't have the answer. They shoot him in the head. They roll him up in a carpet and they take him out of the apartment and they throw him in the furnace. So while he's going up like a Puerto Rican fire log, they go back into door number two, the three of them, and they're ransacking the apartment when my buddy and the magician are waiting outside. So now, just before my old partner is about to knock on door number two, the hitman and the female come up with an idea. The two hitmen tell the girl, listen, this is what we're going to do. If those fucking cops knock on the door, let them in. Start yelling in Yugoslavian. They're not going to know what the fuck you're talking about. And, and, and lead them down the hallway to the kitchen. When you pass this doorway, jump down on the floor. We'll come out behind them. We'll shoot them. After we kill them, we'll drag them out of the apartment. We'll throw them in the furnace and we'll get the fuck out of here. But they never knocked on that door. So a couple of, about a week or two later, the Supers family hasn't seen this guy for a while. They call the police. The detectives get involved. Where the fuck did this guy vanish to? He just vanished. The apartment's ransacked. So they do a run on the apartment at the building and they see there was a 911 call around the last time he was seen. They bring in the magician and my old, my buddy and they go, you know, anything out of, you know, did he answer the door or anything out of order? And they go, no, we didn't knock on that door. We knocked on this door. But my old partner goes, here's the funny thing. When we were leaving, there was a car outside parked in a fire hydrant. I gave it a, a ticket, a parking ticket. That was a getaway car and it was registered to the female. So they bring in the female and she starts fucking tap dancing, of course, trying to, you know, distance herself from her involvement in it. But she gives it up. They grab the hitman, they lock the three of them up, they go back to the building. Now, this is February. They had to shut the fucking heat off in the middle of winter to let that furnace cool down enough that they could get in there and get the guy's bones and skull out of there. So that's a story from my book and the chat and that title is called Last Night a Magician Saved My Life. Oh wow, that was a close call. If if you oh, ever yeah. if you ever had to go on one of those calls where you had someone in a compromising position, yeah, okay, got another one for you from <laughs> NYPD's Flying Circus, Cops, Crime, and Chaos. Early '90s, my partner and I in uniform, we get called out to a short stay motel. You know, it's like people go there because they can't meet due to marital obligations. They charge by the hour, sheets are extra. It's a shitty, dumpy motel where people go to get laid. So it's a Friday night. My partner and I roll up. Comes over as, uh, you know, dispute or too much noise or noise complaint. I'm just about to knock on the door with my nightstick and I hear a woman scream, be a man and put it in my ass. <laughs> so we start fucking laughing, right? <laughs> I drop to my fucking knees. I can't stop laughing. My partner just I will like die and laughing, right? So my partner goes, let's get the fuck out of here. I go, oh no. I says, listen, I see what you're saying. I don't like fucking with people that are having sex. I said, but here's the thing. Someone could be getting fucking raped in there or someone could be tied up in a gimp box like Pulp Fiction. You know what I mean? Like, let's just fucking see. So I take out my nightstick. I fucking, it's a steel door. I give it a couple of wraps. And I hear the woman's voice go, I, I told you you're making too much fucking noise, right? I hear, who is it? I go, police, come on, open up. All right, all right, all right. So you hear rustling inside the room. The door opens. There's this 80-year-old man with no shirt on and a pair of boxer shorts and his fucking testicles, his balls are hanging past his fucking boxer shorts, right? I guess like <laughs> the real lobes as we age, things droop. This motherfucker had like a nutsack hanging out of his pants. Like we're laughing at him, right? And I go, sorry, I go, I'm so sorry. I says, but I got to come in and take a look around. He's like, all right. <laughs> He's like an old man. He opens the door. Granny's in bed with the fucking comforter up to her nose, right? 
And I says, I just got to look around quick. I'll be out of your way. I look around. I go into the bathroom, make sure no one's fucking hiding in the shower. It's cool. We're about to leave. I go, all right, carry on. Sorry to bother you. My partner who can't leave well enough alone goes to the old lady. goes, hey, did he put it in your ass? And she turns around. She goes, would you like to know? And we fucking left. <laughs> the, have you ever had to go on a call to arrest one of your own? I have not, but I was involved in a case. It happens, and I've had friends that had to do it. I was involved in a case. I'm a detective in the auto crime division. I get a call from a, a Department of Motor Vehicle in, a, investigator, and he says, listen, there's this car. I think it was a Toyota Highlander. The car came into New York on a bogus Pennsylvania title. He goes, in all probability, the car is probably stolen. He goes, can you take a look at it? I said, yeah, sure. I, get, I gather all the paperwork, and sure enough, the car came into New York State DMV under a phony title. The clerks at DMV didn't catch it. They punt the title upstate to Albany, but they give the guy a set of plates and they register it. I drive around the neighborhood. I spot the car double parked. There's the car. Pull up. I'm like, hey, let me see your license and registration. The guy shows me his police ID. He goes, listen, I'm on the job. I said, okay. I says, where'd you buy the car? He goes, Jerome Avenue, which is like the wild west of buying cars. And if anybody, your listeners are from the Bronx, just look up Jerome Avenue. So I says, all right, listen, there's a problem with your car. You got to come into the precinct. He goes, all right, very cooperative. I get on the phone with my sergeant as we're going in. I says, listen, I got a member of the service. You know, we call another cop, a member of the service. I go, he's got a stolen car. I says, you're going to have to call internal affairs and start the investigation. He says, all right. So my sergeant comes in. He starts doing a preliminary interview. I get the hidden vehicle identification numbers on the car. Sure enough, the car was stolen from Orlando, Florida, and they drove it all the way up to New York. And then internal affairs got involved in it. And uh, I think he lost his job as a result of it. I, I'm not sure that this has happened just before I retire. But yeah, um, especially like when you're in, I was in the Organized Crime Control Bureau, which falls under the Auto Crime Division. So any, we used to say anytime we go up on a wiretap, a cop would wander onto the playing field. And sometimes it was so, something as innocent as talking to a relative on the phone and the relative is fucking pumping them information. And then there's guys that we snagged that, yeah, I mean, they were in it up to their neck. We did a case where we had um, Ch Chinese nationals in Brooklyn that were shipping up to 30 stolen vehicles a month out of the country to Shanghai. And we were on a wiretap with them. Then we were on a wiretap. The thieves were Spanish. So we had Spanish cops on the wiretaps for the thieves providing the stolen cars. And we had a couple of cops in the Bronx that were running plates for the thieves. So if the thieves saw a car they wanted to steal, they just give them the plate. The cops would run the plate for them and they would go up to this guy's house and steal his car. And what the cops were getting at, the, the cops were motorcycle enthusiasts. So when they would blow an engine on their motorcycle or they, you know, rub the fairing on the bike or they needed new pegs or a new helmet, their friends would provide it for them and they would run plates for them. So yeah, it does happen, unfortunately. You got to realize... The New York City Police Department at any given time is 35,000 to 40,000 members. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that, that's, I mean, you're from Texas. That's a good Texas Ranger attendance on a Friday night, right? <laughs> so you're going to get bad apples come in. I mean, they do their best to screen like psychologicals and you got to provide a lot of information. But unfortunately, you get some bad apples that, but they do get picked off. Mm, it, it's sad, but like I say, it's <laughs> one of those things. Oh. I've I've heard lots of crazy excuses, but <laughs> what's the funniest excuse you ever got for any given, uh, whether it's a citation or whatever? Yeah, um, another story from NYPD through the Looking Glass. Uh, early on in my career, the station wagon with fucking dents blows a light on Pelham Parkway. My partner and I pull the car over. There's a pregnant woman in, in the front seat driving, and they're they're Hasidic they're Hasidic Jews. So she's, she's kind of dressed like a Hasidic Jewish woman. The guy's got the beard and the hat and everything. He's in the passenger seat. So I walk over and I go, hi, can I see your license and registration? And she's fumbling for it. And I go, is there a reason why you went through the red light? And he leans over and he goes, officer, I'm rushing my wife to the hospital. She's in labor. Now, yeah, she's pregnant, but if she were in labor, why isn't he fucking driving, right? right? So I said, okay, no problem. Follow us. Give me a license. I took her information. I go, follow us. 
My partner and I started laughing. We got back in the radio call. We put lights and sirens on. We gave him a police escort to Jacoby Hospital. He's like, no, 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 you don't have to go. I go, no, 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 code blue, code blue. Led them into the hospital, told the security guard to get the head nurse. She comes out, they put her in a wheelchair, they wheel her in the back. I take her information, I pass it through. I make sure they start filling out all the, I'm not a doctor. Now, was it obvious if she wasn't in labor? Yeah, I don't think she was in labor because why wasn't he driving? But I got her admitted into the emergency room. So it, it cost him a hell of a lot more fucking money to pay that ER bill than it would have the fucking, and I wouldn't have <laughs> given her a ticket, but you know, you're gonna be an asshole. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah, I heard a story and whether it's true or not, I don't know, but uh, this guy was driving like really, really fast and the cops pulled him over. I mean, he was exceeding a hundred miles an hour and cop pulls him over and says, uh, Hey, what, you know, you realize how fast you were going? It's like, yeah. And cause you have a pilot's license. And the guy reached in and he actually had a pilot's license. So he <laughs> let him off with a warning. You ever had anything like that? Uh, here's the thing. Like in the NYPD, they'll deny it, but it's true. Every NYPD cop's got to write summonses. You have to. It's called a quota. They deny it. The press asked them about it. They deny it. But here's the deal. In my time, you had to, you had to write 25 parking tickets. 10 moving violations, and the three of those had to be red lights because those were the most expensive. You could arrest Osama bin Laden and deliver 15 babies. If you didn't have your summons numbers, you were going to get a subpar evaluation. So the reality is you had to write tickets. I was never a summons guy. If I pulled somebody over and they had all this shit together, they didn't have a suspended license, their insurance was current, and they were nice or gave me a, even a bullshit excuse or apologize, I'm not going to write you. I mean, there's enough scumbags floating around that we're going to find you, that I'll, I'll be able to get my numbers at the end of the day. But the summons guys, I was never a fan of. Every NYPD precinct has them. Every police department has them. They, they're usually antisocial. They go out by themselves. And it's the guy that was picked on in school or didn't date a pretty girl. And their way of getting back in society is the power of the pen. Yeah, And it's like, sorry, Ma, the law is the law. They're kind of pariahs in a precinct. They don't tend to go out with the other guys and girls after work for a beer. They're kind of introverts. So, you know, in, in New York, they would kind of get their balls busted a lot. Um, I don't know if that's changed, but that that's what went on during my 20 years. Well, with you writing these books, I mean, there's quite a bit of uh i guess you say controversial type stuff in it do you get any flack from that from your your old buddy no, you want to laugh i was very um i i didn't know if i should do it like when i put out before i put out my first book i was still i spent all this money getting the book cover designed i got it edited and i'm standing there with my finger on the laptop like do i fucking upload this thing on amazon because i was terrified of getting flack but here's the thing the two things I set out to do when I was writing these police books was I didn't want to get anybody in trouble and I didn't want to get anybody divorced. You know, I'm not a sour grapes kind of guy. Yeah. So I don't name names. I change precincts and boroughs and time periods around because I don't want to shine a spotlight on a specific person. But I am writing about the time and what was going on. I mean, yeah, a guy really did move a dead body, but I changed things around. You know what I mean? Or the guy that I know that stole a horse and carriage for a ride through Central Park, he almost got fucking killed. I changed his rank around in the time period. You got those rookies that come in, you all uh, play uh, pranks on them. Oh, yeah. And NYPD precinct, forget it. Like the shit that went on in my, anywhere I work, cops are playing pranks on each other. The rookies usually get it the worst. Like I remember in my, my first precinct, like they, they run up to, you know, you get an old time would run up to a rookie that had station house security. He's like, listen, the mounted unit's coming. Go in the fucking, go in the garage and get a couple of bales of hay and some oats. The horses are going to come around the back. And you'd have some rookie digging through garbage looking for fucking bales of hay. It's like, dude, it's the Bronx. <laughs> yeah, we got a mounted unit, but they kind of, they take care of that on their own. Or if they get a, a naive rookie that's answering phones, another cop will call up and say he's calling from the police commissioner's office and to put on the landing lights of the roof because the police commission is going to be landing on the roof of the precinct. So it'd be funny. You'd hear some rookie like yelling shit, but we used to play practical jokes on each other all the time. 
like in one of my books, there's a story. I was a detective. I'm in my office. And when you work in a detective's office, you've got trained observers all around you. Like they notice fucking every, if your shoes untied, they notice it. If your shoes don't match, they notice like they're, they're on you. It's like flies on shit. So one night, it was about six o'clock at night. We're getting out of work. And one of the guys noticed I changed a pair of slacks. So I had a date. I was going out. So when I got up to get a cup of coffee, he took a glass of ice water and soaked my chair. So when I sat in it, I got a wet ass. Everybody's fucking laughing. I'm like, all right, you got me. You got me. Go back upstairs, change my pants. I come downstairs. I'm like, I'm going to get this little prick. I go downstairs across the street from the precinct was a, um, a pet store. I go into the pet store. I buy a hundred crickets. I guess people use those to feed snakes and shit. I buy a hundred crickets. I put them, they put them in a clear plastic bag. I go into the parking lot. I got a Slim Jim. I open up the door to his personal car. I tear the bag and I fucking dump the crickets in the back seat of his car and I shut the fucking door. So about 15 minutes later, we're getting out of work. He was like one of these guys. He's the first one out of the office. I like stop guys. I was like, whoa, 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 let him go. I go, watch this. We were watching from the fucking window. He gets in his car. He starts driving down the street, fucking slams on the brakes, jumps out. He's like, what the fuck? He had to sell that car. He, he bombed it a couple of times with like roach spray and shit and they would die, but he didn't get them all. And apparently those fucking things breed really quick. I mean, it was a shit box car. It was like an old 88 or whatever, but he wound up having to fucking sell that thing. So yeah, we were always busting balls and playing practical jokes on each other. <laughs> all the years that you've been an officer, um, what, what would have been the the one moment, I guess, that made you the most proud? You know, I always, I mean, I was always a worker. I made, in my NYPD career, I made over 600 arrests and I was involved in thousands, which means if me and you were working together and you took the, took the collar, I count that as, as an involvement. But I mean, I was involved in thousands of arrests. I always got a sense of pride when I made a good arrest, a gun arrest, stolen car arrest um i was lucky enough or proud um we call it the kilo ferry in the nypd if you make an arrest with a kilo or more i was lucky enough in my career i had two arrests where i met the kilo ferry one time i pulled over a car there was four kilos in the back seat with three guys another time when i was a detective we got a tip i found five kilos in a trap a hidden compartment on a car so i would say those things and a couple of the big cases i was involved in What's been your biggest hurdle? With the NYPD? Oh, it could be life in general. Biggest hurdle in life. I mean, in life, there's many hurdles, right? I mean, and things change as you move through life. I mean, I would say when I was in the police academy and then I, I went into field training. I mean, I grew up in the Bronx. I was a city kid. My biggest hurdle as a rookie cop was I didn't know what the fuck was going on. Like they say an NFL quarterback, you know, you come out of college and you start and they throw you out there. It's like the game is coming at you too fast. You can't pick up a blitz, you know, personnel changes, protections. As a rookie cop, you're in uniform and people are kind of, New York has got 9 million people. I mean, there's no place in New York that's not populated and people are coming at you with questions and with their problems. And should I arrest this guy? Is this guy full of shit? Is she telling me the truth? So it took a couple of years for it to slow down that I knew that, you know, it's like chess. I knew what was happening before someone actually even opened their mouth. Um, Another hurdle is after I retired. When I retired from the NYPD, I had a wonderful career, but it was time to call it a day. But then it was like musical chairs, like, the NYPD went on without me. And now it's like, what am I going to do with my fucking time? Like I retired relatively young. I was in my early forties. What am I going to do with myself? I mean, that's the only thing I really knew how to do. You know what I mean? And it was like, I tried becoming a cop again down here in Florida. I did that for about eight months and I absolutely despised it. You know, I went from being a detective in America's largest city to, they want me to wrestle fucking alligators. I'm like, no fucking way. Like, I'm not getting, I'm serious. It was like a half day course. I'm like, can't we just shoot this fucking thing? I'm like, oh no, we don't do that down here. So, you know, writing was probably the best thing. It got me over a hurdle because now that's what takes up my time. And then doing these podcasts, like guys like you and put me on their forums that are nice enough to do it, that I'm able to move my book. So I, I get, I guess knowing what to do with myself after I retire. Yeah, that's the thing. And a lot of the guys that I worked with, 
it seemed like within six months to a year after they retired, we'd get news that they passed away. They didn't have anything to do. They, they'd go nuts. They'd get bored. And you, yeah, what, you what did they say in the movie, The Shawshank Redemption? Get busy living or get busy, get busy dying. dying. That's right. Yeah. All right, so the New York City Police Academy, uh, we hire in bulk. So a, a small police academy class is 500. Mm -hmm. A large one could be 2,500. I mean, that's a lot of people to get hired in one shot. It's like McDonald's. I mean, it's just fast food. So before you gradu graduate the academy, they take your class down to Bellevue, which is the morgue down in Manhattan. So we go down there, and I'm picturing what I saw on the television show Quincy or like a TV show where there's one slab, one body. No fucking way, man. The day I went down, it was like a Jiffy Lube. You had like eight bays, right? You had like bodies on each slab. And I mean, they're cutting and weighing like between each slab, each table, you got a produce scale. Remember when you were a kid, your mother like put a fucking head of lettuce in the produce oh, yeah. scale and 99 cents a pound. Well, that's where they, that, in those days, that's how they weighed the fucking organs. So like you're sitting there and they're using that thing, a muff, uh, like the, that thing that cuts muffler pipe at like at the Midas uh, muffler place or with these guys are using to steal fucking catalytic converters. They're sitting there cutting open the chest, popping open the ribs, taking the fucking guy's heart. It was like something out of a horror movie. They're weighing fucking organs in there. There was a pregnant woman that died. She OD. They opened her up, took the baby out, weighed the baby. I'm like, holy shit, what the fuck is this? Uh. Then at the end of the at, at the end of the assembly line where they were doing this, there was a guy that was like fucking hogtied and duct tape and shot multiple times. And there was a detective hanging over the shoulder of the medical examiner that's pulling the fucking bullets out with this tool, looks like a needle nose. And uh, the detective goes, "What do you think?" And the and the, and the, the ME goes, "Suspicious suicide." And everybody starts fucking laughing like the guy was shot like six times and he's duct tape. Tells him <laughs> suspicious suicide. So. That was interesting. Um, I learned that when you're a rookie cop and you get called to these DOAs, after you determine that it's not a suspicious death, a great trick an old timer taught me was you go you go through the kitchen, you get a pot, and you get you, you see if they have any coffee, and you pour the coffee grinds in a pot, and then you burn the pot on the stove, and the coffee grinds permeates the house or apartment and masks the smell of death. Um, mm -hmm. All right, I got a story for you. I walked into a homicide that turned into a morgue story. It's the early 90s. My partner and I get called out to what's supposed to be a cardiac. Six-story walk up. We're on third or fourth floor. We hear yelling and screaming. We go into this apartment. There's a ton of people inside. We make our way through the apartment. It's a galley kitchen. I see a pair of legs sticking out. There's a dead woman on the floor. Her teenage or early 20s son is, is over her. He's crying, mama, mama, mama. The kitchen is just fucking splattered in blood. And you know, when you cut yourself, blood is bright red. But over time, it turns like a rust color. Right. And that's the, the blood was old. So we knew she had been there for at least a couple of hours. We tell, all right, come on, come on, get off of her. We pull him up. We sit him down. The apartment's been fucking ransacked, right? And the second, we're not putting the screws to him. We're just asking him simple questions like, when was the last time you saw your mother? And he went from being hysterical to, when was the last time I saw my mother? Oh, like three hours ago. Do you know who might have done this? Do I know who might have done this? So every question I'm asking this fucking guy, he's repeating it. He's buying time. Then I start looking around the apartment and yeah, it's ransacked, but it's staged. So when a burglar breaks into your house, they're going to start pulling out drawers and dumping them upside down. They don't have time to dump your shit and put the fucking drawer back nice. Right. You know what I mean? It makes no sense. Also, her bag was turned upside down and the contents of her bag were right next to it and the credit cards hadn't been taken. That's the first thing someone will take, right? So it was obvious that he knew more that was going on. The detectives take him to the precinct to talk to him and my partner and I are tasked with collecting evidence, right? We get all that done. We go to the precinct. And I asked the detectives, like, what's going on with this? And they go, he definitely knows more than he's saying. We don't know if he did it or not, but he's not coming clean. And he wanted to leave. He didn't ask for a lawyer because once he asked for a lawyer, all bets are off. But he, he, he wanted to leave. So we let him go. He went home. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a run at him first thing in the morning. Let him get some sleep. We're going to go to his house first thing in the morning and talk to him again. 
and the deceased had three brothers, his uncles, and the detectives told the uncles, like, maybe you could get something out of him because he's not being forthcoming with us. So the next, in, in New York, the, the arriving cops on a homicide scene, you have to go to the morgue next day. So when someone dies in New York and they go to morgue, you got to fill out what's called a toe tag. It's an oak tag thing with rope on it, a little string, and you write your name, your information, and the deceased name, and you tie it around their big toe so they don't mix the bodies up. Mm -hmm. So the following morning, I go to the Bronx morgue. It was at Jacoby Hospital at the time. I'm in uniform. I've been up all night. It's a skeleton crew work, and there's like this 25-year-old guy working there. And I says, I had the paperwork. I says, I'm, I'm police officer Ferrari. I, I'd like to see this person. He goes, okay. And it wasn't like you see on TV with like the slabs where they pull you out. It's a big refrigerated room they had at the time. He goes into this refrigerated room. He wheels out a dead body. He pulls the sheet off. It's a black guy with a beard. And I go, no. I says, I got a Hispanic female. Here's her name. He goes, okay. Wheels the dead black guy back into the room. Wheels out another gurney pulls a sheet off and it's like a white wino. I said, dude, I didn't come here to see every fucking person that croaked in the Bronx last night. I just, I, I wanna see her. I go, let me in that room. Oh, it was like a horror movie. I walk into this fucking big refrigerated room. It's got the, um, the fluorescent light blinking, right? There's like 10 stiffs in there. And I, you know, I, I looked at the toe tag, it's her. I pull the sheet off, I go, that's her. I ID her. I go back to the precinct and the detectives are all celebrating like, I was like, what, what happened? What happened? The following morning, they got up, they went back to the building. When the, thank God the two detectives spoke fluent Spanish. There was two Spanish cop detectives. When they got to the hallway of the building, the, the young guy, the, the son was in there with his uncles and the uncles were laying the wood to him. Like, what's going on with this? You know what happened to your mother? You better tell us. And he gave it up. He didn't, the cops hung back by the stairwell. And they overheard him going, yeah, well, you know, I, uh, uh. what happened was the son was a crackhead. And what would happen is he would go on a crack binge and start stealing from his mother and being abusive to her. So she told him, that's it. You got to get the fuck out of the apartment. You can't live with me no more. He picked up a carving knife from the kitchen. He stabbed her to death. Then he took off all his clothes, took the murder weapon, put it in a plastic bag and left. And when he left, he left the door ajar because he wanted someone else to discover his mother. He comes back three, four hours later, nobody opened the door. Now, people have seen him come back the second time. He knows he can't leave again, right? So what he does is he grabs the phone, he starts calling 911, starts calling his uncles, and he starts this whole fucking thing of, I just, I walked in and I found my mother, but he gave it up. He confessed to, to his uncles in the hallway. The detectives heard him. They brought him back to the precinct. He told the same story all over again. And I just checked recently. I mean, that's got to be like 28 years ago. Wow. And he's still in jail. And I mean, rightfully so. The, the, the sad part of that story, in addition to that woman losing her life, the cop I was working with that night later lost his life. About three, four years later, um, he went out on a domestic violence call. And I forget either a guy, either the guy in the apartment threw a mirror at him or they were fighting and a mirror got broken. And when the cop went to make the arrest, he slipped and a shard of glass from the mirror got him in the groin and he almost bled to death. They rushed him to the hospital and they put him in a compression suit, but ultimately he died. Oh my God, man. Great guy too. What's the biggest case you've ever done? Uh, I worked on two. Um, one was the case I was telling you about. We had Chinese nationals in Brooklyn and they were shipping 30 stolen Audi A6s to Shanghai. We later found out they were going to government officials. Um, <laughs> while we went up on the, we were up on wiretaps. New York City Police Department has so many members. We had Asian cops monitoring their calls in Mandarin and Cantonese. We had Spanish cops monitoring the car thieves. And while we were on these wiretaps, it became apparent that in addition to stealing 30 cars a month, our thieves were in the murder for hire business. And every, most of these guys, like there were 10, 15 guys in this crew and probably about a third of them had bodies on them. Like they were, they were actively killing people and they would brag about it and kid around about it on the phone. And uh, once we took that case down, and I mean, in addition to stopping an international car theft ring, we were able to solve or, or, you know, determine, you know, solve about 15 homicides. 
Jeez, man. Uh, does anybody ever put a hit out on you? I did have a death threat once a long time ago. That guy got arrested for something else. He got like 25 to life. He's on parole. He got paroled. I'm not going to mention names or anything like that. But yeah, I, I've, I, I've, I've had a brush with that where I was taking a radio home. Jeez, man. I can't imagine. Well, I guess it's a lot less dangerous sitting at home writing a book now. Huh? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, and it's fun. <laughs> not as exciting. I don't. That's you were asking about. I love adrenaline, uh, but I'm not one to jump out of a plane or, you know, go running with the fucking bulls or something like that. But I do miss, I mean, I've been involved in probably over a hundred car chases and I love that shit, but you know, in my mid fifties now, would that be the smart thing to do? No, probably not. It's a young man's game. So I do miss the adrenaline, yeah. but I mean, telling these stories and writing these books is a way to keep my finger on the pulse of what I used to do. And you, so you have the books that have more of a comedic type theme to it. What, what are the other ones about? So my last one, Confessions of a Catholic High School Graduate, which got a, a sketch of me running out of a confessional being chased by a priest, which really happened, is about me growing up in the Bronx in the 70s and 80s, what it was like. We weren't holy rollers, but my parents insisted on me going to Catholic high school because I was a behavioral problem. And it turned around my life. Um, and it's just, it's, it's filled with funny stories of guys that I grew up with. I mean, a lot of them are gone now. They got into drugs or became criminals themselves and, you know, went down a bad path. And then I've got another book. I don't have it in front of me, but that's called Dickheads and Debauchery and Other Ingenious Ways to Die. That's the ridiculous things people do to shorten their life expectancy, running with the bulls, just because you may have a plumber's crack doesn't make you a plumber doing electrical work around the house that goes wrong. People going to Disney world, they're obese, eating bitch feeders, you know, the big fucking Turkey legs. You know, it, it, it's just loaded with short stories and observations I've seen from my years. Oh, well, that's um, assuming that's uh, people trying to end their own lives on purpose. Yes. Well, what's yeah. the craziest one that story you have about that? Uh, of what? somebody trying to end their own life oh god um well i've seen deaths where people it was they weren't trying to end their own life but okay so in new york city we got a huge homeless problem mm -hmm. and a lot of times the homeless live in the subway they go into those fucking tunnels and there's cutouts or alcoves where they live mm -hmm. you know what i mean there's fucking rats crawling over and stuff so one of the wildest deaths you'll see from time to time there's a third rail. So you got the, the, there's a rail that's covered by wood in the subway and that's the electricity that pushes that train. Sometimes homeless people step on the third rail, but I've seen people, they're taking a piss and they piss on the third rail and the electricity shoots back up and comes through their dick and blows their dick off or blows their fingers off because the electricity has got to come in one way and it's got to go out another. So I've seen a couple of those where people got electrocuted down in the subway on pissing on the third rail. Oh my gosh! Well, uh, we we did go to the subways when we visited New York, and uh, that was quite an, an experience to say the least. I know those guys try to sell you those uh, bogus uh, subway metro cards. Ticket. Yeah, metro cards. Yeah. Oh my god! Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm I was a tourist, but uh, I'm not that dumb. <laughs> Well, before the Metro cards you used to have these little tokens, there were subway tokens and you would drop it in a slot and you could push the turnstile. The homeless quickly figured out if you put your mouth over that and suck, the token will pop up. So yeah, the homeless used to, they used to, they used to I mean, oh my God, I mean, talk about getting a fucking canker sore. You know what I mean? But you know, every motherfucker's got their hand on that. But yeah, the, the subway, it, it, it's the shit that you'll see down there is amazing. Yeah, I noticed when we were there, the only time anybody acknowledged you is when they wanted to cuss you out or they were trying to get money out of you. Yes. <laughs> and if you don't give them money, that's when they curse you out. Yeah, they had some some kids down there and in, in, uh, oh, it was a Times Square, I believe is where we were at. And they were doing their rap and stuff out there. I threw them a few bucks just to 
to help them out. But uh, yeah, you no. Know, oh, I, I didn't. I didn't fall for a lot of that garbage down there. No, and, and if you're going to New, tell your listeners if you're going to New York, you see them playing three card Monty. It's a game where they put like a, a, a something and then they they cover it with bent cards and they switch it around and you got to guess which one like the chip is under. The game is fixed. There's no way to win it. And there's people in the crowd that are watching. So even if you do win, you're going to get hit in the fucking head. There's also pickpockets where the crowd pulls up. There's no way you're going to win that game. Don't even watch. Just keep going. Times Square was like the Wild West. It still is now, but we cleaned it up and then it went back. When I was a kid, Times Square was all full of sex shops and nudie bars and stuff like that. Like when I was a teenager, me and my friends used to go down there to try to get a fake ID or get fireworks. And we would either get robbed. And if we got robbed with a couple of us, we'd go back with like 10, 15 of us. And then the cops would spot 10, 15 white kids getting off the train. They go, where do you live? The Bronx. Get back on that fucking train and go back up to the Bronx. They would kick, send us back. Then as a cop, I mean, in my 20 years, 17 out of my 20 years, I was down at Times Square where they dropped that ball. Do not go down there. It's not orderly. I know what they show from above, but those people are packed in like cattle and wooden pens. And there's no place to go to the bathroom because all those restaurants, unless you've got dinner reservations with a credit card, they're not letting you in because they've had their bathrooms trashed before. So in that crowd, there's people throwing up, there's people pissing, shitting, changing tampons, getting felt up. Do not go in there. And then even if you make it through that, what happens is all the hood rats from the Bronx, Harlem, Brooklyn, they come up and they're sober as a judge and they just sit back. It's like watching the Discovery Channel. They just sit back like hyenas and they wait. So you got a brand new iPhone. You got an expensive camera. You've got money. And they know you got to take the train and they just follow you in groups. And then like 10, 15 minutes later, we got victims that are drunk off their ass. I got hit in the head. They took my iPhone, blah, blah, blah. blah. What do you look like? I, I don't know. So you're going to get robbed, felt up, or get vomited on. Don't go down to Times Square for New Year's Eve. Vic, I sure appreciate you coming on the show. And Thank and you so much. Time. And, where yeah, and I'm just telling your listeners, if, if they go on Amazon, just type in Vic, V-I-C, Ferrari like the car. All my all my paperbacks are ten dollars. They make great Christmas gifts and stocking stuff. It was they're two ninety nine ebook downloads and ten dollar paperback. That was going to be my next question. All right. um, <laughs> uh, and do you have a website? No, but you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Vic Ferrari five zero five zero. Okay, I'm going to put those links in the description. Make it easier for people that. to and. Um, you know, when you come out with another book, let me know. I'd love to have you come on and talk about it. Yeah, anytime, man. You want me back? I'll, 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 I'm here. And you just plan on keep on writing books or are you going to stop at some point? You know what? Uh, you know, make hay. <laughs> I'm making hay. You know, I'm writing these books. I'm enjoying the podcast. It's like anything else. When it doesn't become fun and I run out of stories, I'll probably figure something else out to do. But right now it's working for me, so I'll just keep at it. Yeah, well, stay busy. That's the I main thing. That. Thank you. Well, once again, thank you. And I also want to thank all of you out there. If you came by the channel, this is your first time. I appreciate you stopping by, and I hope you'll come back. Hit that subscribe button. For those of you that are my regulars, you know how much I appreciate y'all. It's because of you, you, I get to do this. So until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.